Hi, and welcome to Kinesiology 5302. This is Legal Issues in Sport. It's our first week, and this week we'll be doing our brief overview and or for some of you, it's going to be a review of our legal system. This information is covered in Chapter 2 of your text. In addition to that overview of the legal system, we're also going to be examining sources of legal information. This is going to be especially helpful uh, to address a number of assignments that you will be doing throughout the term. Lastly, we'll be looking at citations, legal citations specifically, and we'll be spending some time to how to make sense of that so that you, one, can do legal research, but then also understand what that means. Let's start off by talking in general terms about the American legal system. This system is based on common law tradition. Okay, what does that mean? It is where judges establish previous decisions to present cases. It's known as this concept called stare decisis, and that means literally to assist in deciding future cases. We'll spend a bit more on that concept in a few of the coming slides. Also, it's important to know there are three functions, general functions, I should say, of our court systems. First, we administer state and national laws. It's the responsibility of the court system to administer and ensure those laws are followed. Second, those court systems resolve disputes among parties. Again, in a few minutes, we'll go into much more detail about what that means. Finally, the third portion of our court system or function of our court system is to interpret the legislative intent of a law in a deciding case. That is directly related to our previous concept on common law tradition. Think also in terms, it's stare decisis. In the American legal system, there are two types of law, criminal law and civil law. In criminal law, it's the body of law that identifies what behavior is criminal and stipulates penalties. These laws are typically found in our penal codes. The people in this instance under criminal law is typically represented by the district attorney or the DA. In this instance, there's a dispute between private parties and society. And as I re previously indicated, the people or society is represented by the DA. And the DA must be able to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the person committed the crime. Because of the severe penalties that the criminal might incur, which are such things as fines, jail time, community service, etc., that standard of certainty is that guilt must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In our instance, think 99%. That is, for an individual, individual to be prosecuted under criminal law, it must be shown beyond a reasonable doubt or beyond 99% that that person is guilty of the crime. Although restitution may be paid to the victims of the crime, it's not typical. You see that more typically under civil law. Okay, so what is civil law? Civil law is a dispute between two private parties. In this instance, there's a plaintiff and a defendant. And the body of state and federal law that pertains to civil or private rights and they're forced by civil actions. In civil trial, the plaintiff only has to show a preponderance of evidence or a greater amount that the defendant is liable. Please notice the language. A burden of proof in a criminal trial, as I previously indicated, requires that the courts find beyond a reasonable doubt. So in contrast, in civil law, think 51%. Burden of proof in a civil case only requires the defendant be found 51% responsible for the um, evidence. Okay, let's take a brief uh, recap of that. American legal system is made up of two types of laws, criminal law and civil law. Because of the nature of criminal law, where we have a private party versus society or the people, in this instance, the court must be able to prove but, um, beyond a reasonable doubt. In that way, we need to think about the 99th percentile. In civil law, we're dealing with private parties, and a standard of certainty is that we only have to prove a preponderance of guilt. In that one, 51%. Recall back 
to our second slide where we talked about three functions of the court systems. And that first function was that our court system have to administer state and national laws. Okay, in that case then, what are the sources of our law? We already indicated that the American legal system is based on a common law system or common law tradition. So what does that mean? In this instance, our state and national laws or our court systems rather, have to employ that system of stare decisis. That is, they have to use prior court decisions to guide similar and or future cases. It's typical practice for equal and lower level courts to follow the legal precedents or those prior decisions that have been established by higher level courts. Our second source of law then that our court systems have to administer, constitutional law. Obviously, this law is expressed in our Constitution and approved uh, the Ten Amendments that are known as our Bill of Rights. The Supreme Court ultimately interprets the Constitution, and in, do so, in doing so, they define our rights and our government boundaries. So some things additional in our constitutional law. This sets forth the basic organization, powers, and limits of our government. It also indicates any statute, court ruling, or administrative rule cannot contradict the Constitution. So our first two sources of U.S. law are common law. It's heavily based upon stare decisis or those legal precedents. And two, constitutional law. This is based on our Ten Amendments to the Constitution and or the Bill of Rights. Our third and fourth sources of law are statutory law and administrative law. Statutory law comes from a combination of the following. It's statutes, and those are created by state and federal legislators, and they are indeed enacted laws. Or those can be ordinances. Ordinances are those laws that are enacted at a more local level, city and county government. A couple examples of we can think of regarding statutory law would be Title IX and our uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Those come at both the federal level. Our Volunteer Immunity Act also comes at the federal level. Amateur Sports Act also would come at the federal level and is a statutory law. Some more specific ordinances you may find at the city and county government level might be such things as curfews, garbage laws, and the like. Last, administrative law is our last and final source. This is where administrative agencies, and these are specialized bodies that create uh, legislation at our all three levels. It can be local, state, and federal. And they create specific rules and regulations. You can think about this in terms of the IRS or our tax law or OSHA. Let's look at a quick overview of our legal system structure. Please notice the parallels between a state structure and a federal structure. You can also think about this as the path of law. That is, when court systems address certain situations, it typically starts out at our lower courts. That's a trial court at the state level or the district court at the federal level. It then can move procedurally up. At a state level, it's the Court of Appeals being next, and at the federal level, the U.S. Court of Appeals. Finally, if those issues make the highest court, and at both the state level and the federal level, that would be our Supreme Courts. Again, think about this two ways. Not only our structure, but we could also think about it as the path of law. Let's talk a little more about our legal system structure. On the left-hand side of our slide, we see federal courts. If we think about starting from the bottom, our lower federal courts would start with administrative agencies and specialized courts, as well as that district court. If the law or issue makes its way up, it then would make its way to the Court of Appeals. There are currently 13 Court of Appeals and Texas is in the 5th District. If going past the Court of Appeals, we make our way to the Supreme Court. In addition, what does the Supreme Court have jurisdiction over? They have original jurisdiction. Okay, what does that mean? It means they have jurisdiction or have the right to hear cases involving consuls, ministers, and those involving a state as one of the party. 
In addition, the Supreme Court could hear cases where there's been an appellate jurisdiction or cases tried by the state's highest court that has to do with a federal question. We're going to spend the next couple of slides talking about the civil legal process. And this will essentially walk us through what a civil lawsuit might look like couple of fold on this. It's important to recognize that working in the sport management industry, oftentimes criminal law is not the issue you will face. It typically could be a civil matter. Therefore, we're going to spend some time thinking about what a civil legal process looks like. First, there's a pre-trial, a trial, and a post-trial. We're going to talk our way through some of those steps in a couple of the coming slides. Remember, because this is civil law, it's important to recall the plaintiff only has to show a preponderance of evidence. And what does that mean? Greater amount. Think 51%. We're going to begin by starting about some of the components of the pretrial. And I'm going to make and explain these components through an example. I think that'll help us. Let's just say, for example, we have a collegiate athlete, Pete the pole vaulter, and he was hurt while pole vaulting because he believes he has a faulty pole vault pole. Therefore, Pete the pole vaulter is going to sue the maker of the poles, Pacer. So in this instance, the complaint is that initial pleading filed by the plaintiff. Pete is our plaintiff. He's again filing a plea that he's suing Pacer Pole Company for negligence for making faulty equipment. So who are the parties involved in this instance? The plaintiff is the person that brings the action. This is Pete the pole vaulter. The defendant or the person for whom relief or recovery is sought in this legal action is that pole vault company maker, uh, Pacer. In this instance, then, what court will this be filed under? Or what is the court of jurisdiction? Two ways to think about this. Personal jurisdiction. The court must have sufficient contact with the defendant. In this instance, it would be under the place at which Pete was pole vaulting and was injured. Where was he located? It's also clear to recognize that Pete might have been pole vaulting in, say, California, and Pacer, the pole vaulting company, might actually be located in New York. Also, there's an option that we need to think about that subject matter also might be a jurisdiction. The court might have authority to hear the subject matter and indifference from particularly the personal defendant. Okay, so that gets us few, through a few components of the pretrial. We'll hit a few more in the next slide. We have four more components of a pretrial we need to consider. First is the summons. This is the actual serving of the notice. We can think about it this way. This is where a process server would serve the Pacer Pole Company that has made the faulty pole vaulting poles and tell them that they are being sued by Pete the pole vaulter. The answer would serve as what the defendant, or in our instance, Pacer Pole Vaults, what their response is. We also have a period of discovery, and this is a time for both sides, both Pete the Pole Vaulter and Pacer the Pole Company, to try to make sense and get all of the facts in place. After all of this, we come to what's called pretrial notion. And this is where we may have this notion of getting a strategic advantage uh, in position for that upcoming trial. Also in pretrial notions, if in our instance, or our example, Pete the Pole Vaulter and Pacer Pole Company, if there's any chance of a settlement being agreed upon before going to trial, it will be done here in these pretrial motions. Again, make note, we've gone through seven pretrial areas before we have even taken an issue to court. If we've determined then that the issue is indeed going to court, we will move on, and that's where we'll go next. The following are the components of trial. Some of us may be knowing this by watching various legal shows on TV, but first we're gonna start out with the type of court. And in our example, Pete the Pole Vaulter versus Pacer Pole Company, this is initially gonna to go to trial court or that court of original jurisdiction. If there is ultimately an appeal, then it would move on to the appeals court. 
In the trial, in and of itself, there's obviously things potentially as jury selection, opening and closing arguments, direct and cross-examinations. Plaintiff goes first in this instance, the defendant follows, then closing arguments. And as we know, in any trial, there's ultimately this rendering of decision or judgment. Please note, in our instance, we're talking about a civil issue. So typically, there's no jail time in question. What's being in question oftentimes is uh, restitution. So what happens after the judgment has been offered in the trial? That judgment might stand and the case would end there. However, in the post-trial, we have to recognize there might be appeal process. The appeal is brought forth by the person or party that lost. And in doing this, they want to appeal the losing judgment. There are a couple of reasons why an appeal or how an appeal could be made. The plaintiff feels they did not have an opportunity to state his or her case at trial. The evidence was incorrectly allowed into or even disallowed at the trial. And it can be argued that the interpretation of the law was done so incorrectly. Those are three potential reasons why a, an appeal could be brought after the original judgment was made. Now that we've given us a refresher of our legal system, I want us to move on and talk about then how we can get or gather this legal information. This is gonna be important for us going forward as we'll be doing a number of assignments that's going to require this very concept of legal research. There's two ways to think about legal research or gathering legal information. And for many of you, this would parallel some of the research you've been doing at an academic institution anyways. There's first primary sources. Primary sources are one thing, they are the law. But remember, we can have different sources of law. Think back to our four sources that we talked about that we can have with law. One is the US and state constitutions. We have federal and state statutes. We also have court rulings, common law. You can think also about that as case law. And finally, we have those regulations. Those laws in and of themselves are primary sources. We also have secondary sources. These sources are often done to help us understand and interpret the law. These can be where they examine and form or review the law on various legal issues and topics. We find this in law review articles, professional journals, one concept of that or example of that is the Journal of Legal Aspects of Sport. That one will be timely and aptly applied for your own research. We also could find that those secondary sources might provide definitions through legal journals, excuse me, legal dictionaries to help us understand our terms. Two important ways to get this. Primary sources is the actual law. It's the main source. Secondary sources help us then interpret the law and or the primary sources. Throughout the remainder of the term, we're gonna be looking at and addressing a lot of legal pieces. Most of those are cited with a legal citation. This breakdown gives us a little bit of information and the next slide will go into even more greater detail on what this means. First, listed in a legal citation is always the case name. It's the plaintiff versus. I'll talk more about that in detail in just a second. Legal citations are also done in a reporter where they have to be put in some type of area. Think about it like when you at the local library, it's the library call card. This helps us know where this is located. The next piece of information then is the volume number. It's in volume 55. The third piece of information tells us the name of the reporter. In this instance, it's the federal reporter. I'll give us more information about that in a minute. And the last little number given there in this instance is the page number. This tells us on what page this legal citation might be found. Let's get into a bit more detail about legal citations. As I said in the previous slide, our first piece of information on a legal citation is the parties involved. In this instance, it's Frederick v. Morse, Frederick versus Morse. As with any legal citation, the first 
named party in the citation is the one bringing the suit. That might be the plaintiff, the appellant, or the petitioner. Regardless of that, they're the one bringing the suit. The second name listed and in our example is Morse. This is the one whom the suit is being brought against, whether that's the defendant, appellee, or respondent. It is the one the suit is being brought against. Okay, our which would now be our fourth arrow, we're talking about the number 439. This tells us that Frederick V. Morse, the outcome of this case will be published in volume 439. Think library calling card. It's in the fourth, excuse me, the Federal Reporter third series. That's the F3D. That tells us what book or reporter it's in. And we can find that page number on 1114. That would give us the exact location of where we could find the outcome of Frederick V. Morse. The last piece of information tells us where this decision was ultimately decided. And it was decided by the U.S. Court of Appeals. Notice because it's a circuit court. It's that Ninth Circuit. Go back to our slide where we talked about Supreme Court and what that looked like and the breakdown. We should make note then that that Court of Appeals is a circuit. Finally, when was this decided? It was decided in 2006. It's really important to make note of this. Frederick V. Morse might actually have started their lawsuit in 2004. Maybe it's possible in 2004, Frederick brought a lawsuit against Morse. However, 2006 is the date that's given in the citation. Why? Because it tells us the year the case was decided. Please note that oftentimes as you read legal cases, you'll see that the case was brought or initiated several years prior to the decision. The 2006 date, as in this legal citation, represents the year of the decision. Okay, that concludes our week one lecture. We've given a breakdown of our legal system. We've talked about where we can get legal information, particularly because this is going to be helpful in our coming assignments. And we've also given ourselves some context to what a legal citation looks like. It's important to note there's a bunch of information important information that you can find just in that legal citation. I look forward and I'll see you next week.